Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Had the good fortune uh, to attract Bill here uh, as our uh, leader in making the best research environment possible uh, at the University of Kentucky College of Medicine and in addition uh, to our health, sci health science campus in general. Uh, as you heard from my remarks, Bill is first and foremost a first-rate cardiologist and cardiovascular researcher. And uh, his title uh, is something I suppose we can identify with. How to Mend a Broken Heart, uh, the Promissory Note of Cardiac Cell Replacement Therapy. Bill? Thank you very much, Jay. It's truly uh, an honor to be here uh, for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is I hope in this talk I'm going to be able to show you, Jay, and the rest of you one of the major reasons, apart from uh, friendship and professionalism, that brought me from uh, Baltimore here to uh, Lexington. Uh, the opportunities to do science here are unparalleled, particularly in the areas that uh, the colleagues that came with me and I are very interested in and uh, we have not been uh, disappointed. And you'll see the uh, fruits of some of those uh, labors in a, in a moment. Um, I also uh, want to uh, thank all the, the predecessors uh, in this distinguished lecture series. They've raised the bar very, very high, which kept me up uh, very late at night, trying to make sure that I don't disappoint them uh, as well. Usually, uh, we start with uh, credits uh, at the end, well, usually you have credits at the end. I'd really like to start with credits at the beginning because this work is, is really represents the interface of the triangulation of a number of different individuals with a great deal of uh, different skills that have come together for common interests in understanding uh, cardiovascular disease in general and the role that cell replacement therapy may or may not play in the future. And the people that were absolutely key to uh, this effort are uh, the laboratory of John Satin here in uh, University of Kentucky's Department of Physiology. His close and long-standing uh, collaborations with uh, the Gepstein Lab and Technion University in Haifa. And a relative newcomer, uh, myself and our faculty and postdocs at the Institute of Molecular Medicine at UK. Uh, this is truly a, uh, a collaborative effort and we're uh, uh, very pleased to have as partners such uh, uh, notable scientists as John Satin and the Gepstein, uh, Gepstein Group. The other thing I want to say is I think working together with a PhD scientist and a clinician scientist really fits very nicely into the temperament that's been building in this campus over the last uh, two and a half or two years. It's the uh, translational components of basic science mechanistic research, its clinical applications, all under our evolving Center for Clinical and Translational Science. So I think this is a really wonderful example of the synergy between these areas of expertise uh, that are amplified by all the members of these groups that uh, uh, have made all of this possible. So for those of you who are not cardiologists, let me just take a moment to describe uh, the clinical problem and, and the broken heart. Heart failure-related uh, deaths have risen steadily over the past uh, 25 years in spite of or perhaps even because of uh, the decline in heart disease in general uh, during the same period. In other words, in, instead of dying from heart attacks uh, that people did 25 years ago, we're finding new and novel ways to uh, repair those hearts and they live on to have with damaged hearts, which leads to heart failure. It is now the single most frequent cause of hospitalization in individuals over the age of 65 and patients with moderate to severe CHF have a two-year mortality approaching 50 percent 
uh, in spite of optimal treatment, and that's treatment with all the latest things that we now give, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, aldosterone therapy. <clears throat> and in addition to pump failure, heart failure patients have an incidence of sudden death that is six to nine times that in the regular population. In this graph, you can see the hospital discharge rate uh, statistics from the American Heart Association, and you can see the, uh, the uh, sad rise in uh, discharges for congestive heart failure uh, that affects both men and women. So cardiac cell replacement therapy, it's a promising opportunity. It's not an opportunity that's right here, right now, but it is uh, something that's on the horizon. And why? There's a real compelling need for this because in spite of all of our efforts, heart transplantation, transplantation will never, ever be the answer for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is there, an, there is an insufficient number of donors. Uh, and those, the donor pool is hopefully decreasing with increased vigilance in uh, legislation against uh, activities that uh, lead to uh, premature death. Left ventricular assist devices, which are offered now, are cost ineffective in many individuals and the results are mixed and they're certainly not a long-term solution for most people with a failing heart. So cell replacement therapy. There is a lot of supportive preclinical data to suggest that this may be a viable alternative to the uh, limited uh, measures that we have so far. There's promising early but anecdotal clinical experience to the benefits of cell therapy, and it's intuitively appealing for most of us. It's logical. If, if the liver can regenerate, which we all know it can do, why can't the heart and other organs? So this is something that's here and now. Uh, in, some, in some aspects. And if you do a, a internet search, you can see a number of, of sites of early clinical trials, like this one of Johns Hopkins looking at uh, human trials with donor uh, adult stem cells to repair muscle damage from a heart attack. And it's really a randomized phase one trial limited to 48 patients. And it's one of the early uh, clinical trials that's now in progress. <clears throat> if you look at a compendium, of uh, some other clinical trials that either uh, that have completed, you can see that are, there are more than a handful there. One of the largest, the BOOST trial, has uh, 30 treated and 30 controls, and it showed real benefit in some uh, surrogate markers for uh, contractility, improvements in regional wall motion, and global improvements in left ventricular ejection fraction. If you sum all the work that's been done, both in animal and in human studies, uh, to quote uh, Bernard Gesch, who spoke at uh, la this year's International Society for Genomics and Proteomics and Cell Therapy, there's a real universality of benefit in these animal and clinical studies. As a composite, they uh, inscribe uh, increases in left ventricular ejection fraction, decreases in infarct size, improved diastolic function, improved uh, cardiac remodeling, improved for per, uh, perfusion. And in the studies that have gone out for any distance in time, the benefits seem to be maintained at least uh, up to one year. This universality of benefit uh, is really remarkable because it's independent of the number of uh, cells that are transplanted. It seems to be independent of the site of delivery and the method of delivery and it seems to be effective both early and late after uh, uh, cardiac damage from a myocardial infarction. And when you really think about it, this is an unprecedented uh, type of development in medicine. It's really the silver bullet for a, an entire disease. It would be the anal an, an analogy would be having a single antibiotic that would uh, take care of all bacterial infections or a single antiviral agent that would be equally effective against uh, influenza or HIV with absolutely no toxicities or side effects. Um, <clears throat> so the potential is absolutely enormous, and, and I personally have never seen anything like this uh, since I finished my training in 1991, or even during my training. So what are some of the potential mechanisms for all this universality of positive effect? And it's really not known whether these mechanisms act through uh, protection, through repair of damaged myocardium, or through regeneration in one form or another. And perhaps it involves some combination of all three. 
It could involve differentiation of the transplanted cells into cardiac cells, fusion of the transplanted cells uh, into existing myocytes in the surviving myocardium. It could be passive mechanical support and scaffolding, nothing more than, uh, than that from the transplanted cells. There's also evolving evidence, both clinical and basic science, that there's cytokine and paracrine uh, effects, perhaps activation of resident cardiac stem cells, angiogenesis, inflammation that may be positive rather than negative, and de decreases in uh, apoptosis or, or programmed cell death. So in thinking about using cell therapy, there's a variety of different approaches. There are the uh, intrinsic uh, mechanisms and the extrinsic, and I'm going to focus mostly on the extrinsic mechanisms. And just so you have a sort of bookmarks for how to think about cell transplantation, there's a variety of different types that are being uh, used actively in, uh, in both clinical and animal investigations. Adult stem cell mobilization is one strategy. Uh, reactivation of the cell cycle in existing cardiomyocytes is another. Transplantation of a variety of cell types, fetal cardiomyocytes, uh, skeletal uh, muscle cells, endothelial stem cells, adult stem cells with myogenic potential, and embryonic stem cells that have been uh, uh, forced partway down the differentiation pathway into cell-derived cardiomyocytes. And I want to focus on this because it's one of the most promising and one of the most interesting uh, areas, and it's also one with which uh, UK has, uh, through the work of John Satin and his collaborations with the Gepstein Group, have really put uh, this institution in national and international prominence. And I'll spend a little time on the evidence, the scientific evidence uh, that we have worked on to document survival of those cells into a native myocardium, engraftment so that they're actually functionally connected, that that coupling is uh, structural and physiologic, and a demonstration that we've been able to bring with our advanced imaging techniques uh, to dissect the machinery of uh, excitation contraction coupling. So just to get started and make sure we're all on the same page, just go through the definitions of a stem cell. And they have a couple of characteristics which really make them very different than the other sorts of cells that populate most of our adult organs. They have a capacity for self-renewal, and they may or may not be, uh, and uh, they can divide, and they may or may not be uh, immortal. So they're really, uh, in, in the lexicon of stem cell biology, there, there are four terms that I think really we need to be clear on. Totipotent stem cells are those that can replicate and differentiate and become an entire organism. And all cells in the early embryo within the 16 cell stage are totipotent, uh, more or less, in most species, most mammalian species. Pluripotent stem cells, or embryonic stem cells, are really the descendants from totipotent cells, and they can differentiate into cells uh, 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 that can form all three germ layers of the body. They can specialize into any bodily tissue, but they themselves cannot go backwards and be used to generate an entire organism. Multipotent stem cells can produce uh, <clears throat> cells only of a closely related uh, family, such as the hemopoietic stem cells can differentiate into red blood cells or white blood cells or platelets. <coughs> Excuse me. And unipotent cells can produce only one cell type, but have the property of self-renewal. So there's a winding and complex road to go from stem cell to differentiated cell in the heart. And we don't understand all the uh, switches to these pathways, but some of them are, are coming uh, to light. Uh, different factors uh, that can determine whether cells go to mesoderm versus ectoderm, different pathways that either inhibit or promote the further dif differentiation uh, in, into adult cardiac cells. Knowledge of these factors become tools for man manipulation of these pluripotent cells into, uh, into ultimately into cardiac myocytes. So barring some slides from uh, John Satin, who's got this nice uh, lineage of potential uses for human embryonic stem cells, you can really see that they can be used as a model of cardiac differentiation in general. They can be used for drug uh, discovery and screening, uh, for models of human disease such as heart failure, and through genetic, genetic manipulation, some of which I showed on the previous slide, 
they can be forced down specific pathways. And in this particular case, into pathways that uh, recapitulate cardiac phenotypes. So these are human embryonic stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. And these uh, are, are obtained from fertilized eggs, which are uh, in the early stages of their development, plated in uh, uh, specific media on uh, feeder cells from irradiated uh, mouse fibroblasts. And the cells that, that I'm going to describe are in full compliance with all the government regulations on stem cell science and stem cell biology. And it's one of the accepted and known uh, 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 populations that are used throughout this country and the world. These uh, cells, as I said, they replicate uh, time and time again. Uh, and under the appropriate conditions, they can be forced down a variety of different pathways. And we're going to focus on the pathways that lead us to cardiomyocytes. And this is uh, a slide showing schematically uh, in, in a little more detail with exact uh, photographs and a video movie of these cells. And you can see embryonic uh, uh, stem cell derived cardiomyocytes uh, form in some cases embryoid bodies which spontaneously contract as you can see the, uh, in this video clip. So let's talk about the first issue and that is survival of these myocytes. And the first panel just shows uh, a, a, a transmission electron micrograph of a human undifferentiated uh, embryonic stem cell. Uh, that had uh, differentiated into a derived uh, uh, embryoid body. It's 27 days after plating. And you don't have to be a, a real um, uh, cell biologist to see many of the structures, the myofilaments and the z-lines, consistent with uh, a cell that has contractile capability are, are very, very evident. Looking at the same sort of preparation but using immunocytochemistry to stain uh, proteins uh, that are signals or, or, or uh, markers for the contractile apparatus, you can see that alpha myosin heavy chain antibodies uh, show a pattern that's very consistent with uh, a, a muscle cell. Looking further at survival, the top panel shows calcium transients. And these are the transient elevations of calcium that are actually the signature of uh, a functional beating uh, cardiac cell and, and other muscle cells as well. And they're registered by uh, exposing a cell to an indicator that changes its fluorescent properties when it binds to calcium. And those, those changes in fluorescence are recorded in a variety of methods, whether they're uh, epifluorescence cameras or a confocal microscope. And you can see that these human ES cells have, uh, with uh, spontaneous beating, a transient elevation in calcium and then a di diastolic decline and then uh, uh, continuing patterns that correspond to the rhythmicity of uh, these cells and their beating. They also have the electrophysiological footprint of uh, living cardiac cells with depolarizations uh, that are coincident with these, um, these contractions, although these are on a different time scale. So going to the next issue, what about engraftment? Do these cells really make connections? Do they persist once they're uh, uh, transplanted into a host myocardium? And this is an example of such uh, an engraftment. This is a, uh, 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 section that shows the morphologic characterization of, of a mouse cryo-injury model. In other words, a mouse model of myocardial injury where embryonic stem cell derived cardiomyocytes have been transplanted. And they can be distinguished from the native myocardium because they are labeled with green enhanced green fluorescent protein. And they appear as these bright green stripes in this uh, transverse section of the left ventricular wall of an injured mouse heart. And you can see these large numbers of myocytes that survive even weeks after the injury uh, and are quite distinct from this yellow autofluorescence of the fibrous scar of the, the, uh, the injury. What about, I showed you some electrophysiologic characteristics of cells that were in a dish. What about those uh, in transplanted cells that were actually in a heart? And this represents an experiment where these human 
uh, embryonic stem cell derived cardiomyocytes are isolated from the hearts of uh, an animal with an infarct. And you, they are easily distinguishable based on their uh, green fluorescent protein. These records, B, C, and D, show the electrophysiologic signatures of these cells. And these are action potential recordings uh, from a control from these EGFP uh, cells five days after they were transplanted and then 11 days after transplantation. And I think the take home message is, is that even though they're isolated, after they've been transplanted, they're viable with the electrophysiological characteristics typical of a normal myocardial cell. Uh, with a rapid rise, an overshoot, and a decline. And it's, uh, the, the duration is prolonged early after transplantation, but 11 days later, it's almost superimposable on a normal uh, uh, action potential obtained from uh, uh, non-transplanted or native cells. Looking at this in further detail, at, at the activity of individual channels on these cells, they also have the signatures of the major uh, uh, inward currents that are responsible for maintaining action potentials. Sodium, potent, uh, uh, sodium currents, L-type calcium currents are evident in these cells and look very similar uh, in amplitude and in kinetics to the same kinds of recordings that are attained from normal myocytes. If you look at the force that's generated by these transplanted cells in comparison to cells from injured areas, the force uh, over time of the cells which are green is very close to what the normal myocardium is, which is up here in this insert, relative to the cells from the injured myocardium. So clearly, in these animal models, taking these human uh, embryonic stem cell derived cardiomyocytes, they survive, they engraft, they have electrical characteristics similar to normal cells, they have uh, calcium transients similar to normal cells, and they're also able to generate force. On a more uh, in vivo uh, experiment, looking at the ec uh, echocardiography, looking at a two-dimensional and, uh, and M mode, you can clearly see four days after uh, an infarcted heart, there's a marked attenuation of contractility. You don't need to be an echocardiographer to see that in each beat, the two walls, and this is the, uh, the, the uh, chamber of the heart with the, with the walls on both sides, are, don't look very dynamic, as opposed to here, where with each systole, the walls come together and, and blood is moved into the aorta. So clearly, uh, 14 days later, after transplantation, uh, there's uh, uh, even a qualitative improvement in the ability of the heart to function. So moving on to physiological coupling. This is a, 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 an experiment, a landmark experiment, to look at these, uh, the function of these cells in a little bit more detail. And this is a, a very nice experiment where uh, cells were, uh, were implanted in a transgenic uh, mouse. Um, and this is a three-dimensional picture of small area of the surface of uh, uh, a mouse heart with a normal native myocardium here and the transplanted cells here. The, the uh, transplanted cells are labeled with uh, green fluorescent protein, as I showed you before, and the muscle cells of, of both uh, the transplanted and the mouse are labeled with uh, another dye that's specific for myosin heavy chain protein. So cells that are native myocardium appear red. Cells that are the transplanted cells have both the red and the green indicator, and when they're superimposed, red and green form this yellow color. So if you <clears throat> take, instead of looking at it uh, in two dimensions, but take a line scan I image, in other words, just look through this area repeatedly through time, you can stack these images uh, with distance going from left to right and time going from top to bottom. And you can see a number of different cells. You can see this cell one, which corresponds to right here, which is fairly red, which is a native myocardial cell. You see this cell here, which is cell two, which is yellow, which means it's the, the uh, co-localization of the red and the green. Uh, cell three, which is another transplanted cell, a little out of focus, and so on, until you get over here to cell seven, which is again the native myocardium. So clearly these cells 
uh, uh, engraft and appear at least physically to be coupled to the native myocardium. If you look functionally, and this is the same uh, picture, at these um, uh, calcium transients looking at the uh, calcium indicator, you can see cell one, which is the native myocardium, has uh, elevations in calcium with each action potential, and cell two, which is the transplanted, has uh, calcium transients which are in register with those of the native myocardium, really indicating that these things are beating as one. And the same kind of uh, parallels hold whether you're stimulating uh, slowly, relatively slowly, or rapidly. So they track one another uh, and indicate that they are closely coupled. This is uh, the first experiment from the work done here at University of Kentucky, which takes those observations uh, uh, several steps forward. Um, and I'm going to take just a moment to explain this because this is an absolutely elegant experiment. This is an example of a co-culture where you take the, these embryonic stem cell derived cardiomyocytes and culture them on the same dish that you do cardiac cells, in this particular case, from a neonatal rat. And this is a picture of that, and this is part of a plate where you've got these two cultures growing together. Uh, it's these little black dots, they're sitting on a microelectrode array, which enables uh, us to look at the electrical activity of the cells that are plated over top of them. And it's very, very nice. These are the rat cells here, and these are the, uh, the uh, ES-derived uh, cells up here, with the electrode red sitting right in the middle of the, uh, the uh, uh, stem cell derived myocytes and the green sitting right smack in the middle of the, uh, the rat cells. And <clears throat> these maps, this map here, shows a register of the electrical activity when these cells spontaneously beat. Red means act, uh, uh, the closest activation site and blue is activated later in time from the initial. And you can see the, uh, the impulse begins in the area of the rat culture and, and is transmitted through to the human cultures, indicating a, an electrically uh, functional syncytium of cardiac muscle. The electrograms recorded from these show expectedly a, uh, an in-phase register of these two electrograms, meaning that the impulse began here, traversed through here, and activated the human cells. If you go a little further, <coughs> and you actually pace these uh, rather than rely on spontaneous activity, uh, you can show that if you pace the rat, the impulse progresses into the human cells. And that's uh, inscribed uh, here with a pacemaker spike mm -hmm. on both, activation of the, the rat uh, cells, and then a subsequent activation of the human cells, and vice versa. If you pace the human cells, the impulse spreads uh, easily uh, uh, into the rat cells. Again, I think some of the most elegant evidence of a functional sensation and uh, interaction between these cell types. How is all of this accomplished? Well, cells talk to each other in a variety of, of ways, as you know. One of them is through gap junctions between uh, the ends and the sides of the cells as they couple to one another, a low resistance pathway for electrical activity as well as ion exchange. And this is, uh, again, uh, further work from, from UK that describes the existence of gap junctions from these uh, embryonic cells to the, uh, to the rat cells. Here, the embryonic cells are, are identified and distinguished from the rat because they are stained with uh, an anti-human mitochondrial antibody, which, which appears red in con uh, confocal microscopy. The uh, nuclei of all the cells are labeled blue. So the cells that are blue alone without this are the, uh, the resident or the native uh, 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 rat cells, and the cells that are red and blue are the human cells. The, uh, <clears throat> the gap junctions are distinguished by immunostaining uh, uh, of uh, Connexon 43. This image over here is the superimposition of these two images, and where you see the green superimposed on the red, you are recognizing the gap junctions that connect these um, uh, ES cell-derived cardiomyocytes from, uh, connect them to the rat cells. And I'm going to skip this slide and spend a little bit of time on this side, because this is, I think, one of the best examples 
of an elegant experiment that I've ever seen. This is an example of mapping electrical activity in a, in a swine heart that has been, received cell transplantation, recognizing that that sequence of activation originated at the, size, at the site of that transplantation and then proving it by localizing the cells that were transplanted and identifying them as human uh, embryonic stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. And let me show you how that was done. These two panels represent activation maps of the whole heart in the anterior uh, posterior, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the anterior posterior and the left lateral views uh, in uh, the normal rhythm or a junctional rhythm in this animal. This represents the same views but activation sequences in a new rhythm that emerged after these cells were transplanted. So it's not the native rhythm uh, at all. And these animals had uh, experimentally induced atrioventricular block. And you can see here the activation starts in the red, which is on the septum of this heart, and proceeds over time to the uh, uh, left lateral posterior view of the heart, which is typical of the way hopefully all of our hearts here are being activated right now. Contrary, in, in this, uh, in, later on in this animal, there was a new uh, uh, rhythm that spontaneously emerged that started really here in the back of the heart and moved forward and activated the septum last. So the question is, is this really originating at the site of these uh, transplanted uh, cells? And a very clever way to answer that question was devised by the investigators. During this mapping, they took a radioablation catheter and put a, uh, a mark the uh, myocardium with a little burn of two centimeters precisely from the area that they measured as earliest activation. Then the animals were sacrificed. They lo localized the point of that burn as noted by this little uh, uh, needle here to the suture that they left in the myocardium when they put the cells in to begin with during the cell transplantation and it was exactly the same distance. Going even further, once they identified that, they looked at the uh, actual cell type and used some of the same labeling techniques that I've already described before to make sure that at the site of earliest activation was truly the site where they had transplanted these human embryonic stem cell derived cardiomyocytes several weeks before. And I won't go through all the details of this, but this is the same sequence of staining where you stain all the myocardium with one antibody, stain uh, the, uh, use an antibody to label the uh, human cells, and then see where they superimpose as the site. Uh, this is an area of interest blown up here, and you can see that these cells have many of the morphologic characteristics of functioning cardiac cells and have the staining characteristics that make them unequivocally uh, derived from, or actually, these human cell-derived cardiomyocytes. And this is just more of the same. So we come to the last question, which is where our laboratory, I think, played an important role. We've got adult cardiac myocytes, and this is a, a photomicrograph of an isolated cardiac cell. It is elongated. It's about 150 microns long, about 50 microns high and about 75 microns wide, has clear striations that you would expect of a cardiac muscle, or for that matter, many, mus many different muscle types. This is a photomicrograph of a, a neonatal cardiac cell and photomicrographs of these uh, ES cell-derived cardiomyocytes. These obviously look very different. Even though we've shown survival, engraftment, um, and coupling both structurally and physiologically, do these cells really have the machinery to pull off the improvements in survival that have been anecdotally observed in the clinical studies that I started with and in some of the experimental studies? And that's where uh, all the people in my laboratory were working with the Satin Laboratory to really uh, begin to come into the uh, uh, describe the mechanisms by which this may occur. This is uh, one of the uh, uh, figures from a paper that we have in review right now in cardiovascular research, which starts to examine these cells with the perspective of uh, key sarcomeric proteins that are important for uh, contractility, ryanidine receptors, 
which are the key players in calcium homeostasis in, in functional muscle cells. And you can see that they are plentiful in both, and when you merge them, there is proximity of these two things in parts of the myocyte, perhaps not as co-localized as you might see in a myocyte from a mature uh, animal, but still in close proximity in, very place, in, in various places. So we wanted to look at this functionally, and uh, we were able to use uh, the expertise that uh, uh, Dr. Leighton Izu in our lab has with uh, uh, advanced microscopy and modeling techniques to image these cells using our confocal microscope and to look at the uh, changes in calcium uh, during spontaneous contractions. So this is the picture of the cell and the axis of investigation is right along here and we just look through the cell through time. And those uh, images are stacked uh, left to right here through time. So distance is here and time goes this way and it's this line just stacked multiple times. And as in the images I showed you before, you can clearly see a rhythmic release and reuptake of calcium that coincides uh, with the action potentials which aren't uh, recorded here. If you draw a line through here, you can see the, uh, the uh, uh, averaged calcium transients uh, through this tracing. And on the edge, uh, you can see them as well, although in addition, you also see other little peaks that uh, fall within these large calcium transients. So this particular slide demonstrates two signature characteristics uh, necessary for contractility. Uh, action potential induced calcium release and these small calcium sparks at the periphery. This, these signature events are nearly identical to what we see in mature cells that aren't characterized by tube tubules, such as uh, atrial cells. And this is the expertise that several of the investigators in, in our lab brought and, uh, to bear on this cell type from uh, John Satin's lab. Looking further uh, at this, uh, you, can, you can see that uh, it's the same, same sort of pattern and uh, you can see even a little bit more prominently some of the sparks. There's some other characteristics here that are very revealing that I really won't uh, spend a lot of time with because I want to uh, go through a few other uh, things and I want to conclude backing away from the science a little bit and uh, using the science to help guide us through some of the moral imperatives of the problem in general and the use of these cells in particular. The other important set of experiments here, though, is that using TTX, which is a blocker of sodium current, to attenuate the, uh, the uh, electrical activity of these cells, you can completely block the changes in calcium, further uh, emphasizing that the key elements of the machinery for contractility are in these cell types. And using caffeine as a way to deplete the uh, calcium from stores in the intracellular compartment of these cells in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you can do very much in these cells what we have done in uh, mature myocytes, and you can markedly attenuate, if not completely eliminate, the uh, contractility. And these uh, slides are, again, the line scan images with the spatially averaged uh, image through the center. And so, in conclusion, through our work and others, I think it's fairly clear that the ES cell-derived cardiomyocytes survive, they engraft, they couple both physiologically and structurally to native myocytes. The, there's intact machinery, including the uh, major molecular components, including the L-type calcium channel, which provides the trigger calcium for EC coupling, the reanidine receptor, which is the major intracellular channel that controls the release of calcium from uh, reanidine and caffeine-sensitive calcium stores. The uh, action potential SR calcium release, as I showed you in those multiple images, and calcium sparks, which occur at the uh, co-localization of the sarcolemma and the reanidine receptors immediately adjacent to them. However, stepping back from the science, there's a lot more to be considered than just the mechanisms of how all this works. I think it's fair to say anybody out there think will recognize that this is a double-edged sword for heart failure. There are clear advantages. These cells are available, 
They have the potential for uh, being used to determine different cardiac cell types. You can man manipulate them genetically and use them as vehicles uh, to deliver things in addition to their own intrinsic contractile and electrophysiological properties. Uh, and they have their own unique uh, structural properties as well. But there's some disadvantages. There's a need for large quantities. They have the potential, at least, being oncogenic. And we certainly have seen the uh, higher incidence of teratoma formation in some uh, ES uh, cell uh, types. They have a, the propensity for an immune reaction. Uh, there's uh, been several descriptions of the acceleration of atherogenesis. There's always the possibility of multi-organ seeding. And there's, uh, at least with a bone marrow-derived stem cells, the documented prothrombic risk and accelerated atherosclerosis and instant restenosis. So these are all com uh, complications. Also, variable coupling as a substrate for arrhythmias. It may not apply to every cell type, but it clearly has been described with skeletal myoblasts because they don't form gap junctions with the native my uh, myocardium. And in experimental models, they are profoundly arrhythmogenic. So the cure may be much worse than the disease. Uh, the development differences between uh, ES cell-derived cardiomyocytes and the host myocardium are obvious, just from the photomicrograph of those cells next to one another. The ion channels are similar, but the densities aren't identical. There are other EC coupling proteins that either aren't present or are present in different combinations. Uh, and we don't know all the details about receptors and gap junctions yet. So, borrowing a page from my Baltimore days, H.L. Uh, Mencken always uh, had a word of caution. For every complex human problem, such as heart failure, there is a neat and simple answer, cell replacement therapy. Unfortunately, that may be wrong. And considering that, how do you proceed? And I'm stepping again back from the blades of grass and trying to look at this from a much higher level. You could ask, why proceed with clinical trials when so many basic questions remain unanswered? I think with our collaborations and our translational opportunities here, we've really advanced the envelope on some of the questions, particularly some of the mechanisms. But there's a lot left that needs to be answered. And I think the best answer to this question is one that Bernard Gesch also gave at that conference just a few months ago, is that the mechanisms of any therapy really depend on our current perceptions of the state of the science. And let me give you a couple examples, four examples drawn straight from cardiovascular research. We had been using aspirin for the last hundred years before we had the faintest clue about what its mechanisms of action were and why it was protective in, in uh, 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 sudden cardiac syndromes. Statin therapy uh, was used. It, there isn't a month that goes by that when I read the literature or do a search that I don't find some new uh, potential indication or benefit from statin therapy apart from its direct effects, effects on lipids. Uh, the most recent was endothelial cell uh, mobilization was one of the things attributed to statin therapy. ACE inhibitors, as you know, uh, their major impact is on the renin-angiotensin system. But remember that they were instituted for their afterload effects. And aldosterone antagonists, 20 years ago, uh, little known, underprescribed uh, uh, diuretic. Today is the mainstay and the latest uh, major advance in the treatment of heart failure. So I think these experiences really lead, must lead us to this statement which I started with. Clinical trials in this area, they must proceed. The, the benefits are too great and the risks are too high. But they have to proceed in the translational context of basic science, science studies. So future clinical trials need to really answer these kinds of questions. What are the mechanisms? Which patients benefit from cell replacement therapy? What are the endpoints? If the endpoints are death or cardiovascular events, that would be nice. It would be definitive. But those trials are huge and prohibitively expensive. So we will probably have to settle for surrogate endpoints. But they're going to have to be selected with a great deal of intelligence and caution. I don't have to remind any of you uh, the folly that we had with CAST, the antiarrhythmic drug trial of, the, uh, of several years ago. Uh, it was, there was a lot of promise that uh, if you were able to attenuate the presence of premature ventricular contractions, you would lower sudden death. 
In fact, it was such an appealing hypothesis, a lot of cardiologists in this country felt there doesn't need to be a trial. Just start using them. Well, a trial was done. And absolutely, to everybody's predictions, those drugs were extraordinarily effective in decreasing the incidence of premature ventricular contractions. They also uh, decreased the incidence of patients and killed many more patients than they saved. Uh, and I think we learned a lot uh, from those trials. Another uh, more famous or more recent egg on our face kind of uh, uh, misleading of surrogate endpoints was the Milroan trials. The idea being you give a drug that increases cyclic AMP, increases uh, uh, energy and contractility, you are going to save lives. Well, it did all of those things except for the save live part. Uh, Milrinone uh, uh, killed a lot more people than, uh, than it uh, helped and it was withdrawn from the market before the trial was even, even completed. Other questions, what cell types, when do you give it relative to cardiac injury, the method and sites of delivery, ad, uh, adjunctive therapy to help the all aspects, survival, engraftment, coupling, uh, and a number of safety issues. And lastly, there are a lot of other challenges, funding challenges. I think industry, pharmaceutical companies, device companies are going to be a little slow to get on board with cell replacement therapy. The NIH is, is uh, subject to a lot of political pressure. There are a lot of restrictions, as you all know, and, and is in the paper every week on uh, stem cell therapy and usage. And there are a lot of ethical concerns, and I don't want to diminish this. These are real, they're genuine, and they're sincere. And the right way to move forward is to engage the public now and in every aspect of clinical and basic science on stem cell and replacement therapy. And again, to uh, uh, coin a phrase from uh, uh, Dr. Gesh, this involvement, proactive involvement, really becomes the equivalent of a social informed consent. And I really like that uh, phrase a lot because there's a lot of wisdom and understanding behind it. I s already mentioned a number of political issues. And again, the translational interaction between clinical and basic science is absolutely imperative. Uh, here. We are not ready yet to take two stem cells and call uh, the clinicians in the morning, but we're getting there. And uh, I don't think there's a better place to get us there than uh, the, than the uh, activities and the interactions between the basic and clinical scientists here at UK. Thank you.